Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on metals. And in today's lesson, we're going to look at gas volume and their relationship to the mole. Okay? And here we have Emile Clapeyron, which is another French scientist dealing with moles and also gases. And he is a prime figure in what we're about to talk about in a sec. Okay? So, the ideal gas law. This is what ties together um, or what explains Avogadro's law and it essentially is the mathematical representation of Avogadro's law. Okay? So this equation was first developed by Emile Clapeyron which is um, and he did it from experiments and then later um, a scientist called Clausius um, developed this same equation but from sort of first principles um, through thermodynamics. So it was sort of coined by Clapeyron, but, um, but then was kind of re-derived just um, through first principles and theory by another guy called Clausius. Okay? So here it is. This is our equation. And the equation relates the volume of a gas to the number of moles, assuming the temperature and pressure are kept constant. Okay? So you can see pressure times volume equals the number of moles, n, times this r, which is a constant, times the temperature. Okay? So if you keep this constant and this constant, and you know this is a constant, then if you know the number of moles, then you know the volume. Or if you know the volume, you know the number of moles, one or the other. Okay? An alternative representation is down here. Um, and we'll go through what that means in a sec. So R bar, or R with the over bar, is called the universal gas constant, and it has value 8.314 joules per, kil per kelvin per mole. Okay? So this is just a constant. Everybody knows this constant, um, in, obviously, in who studies these things. Now in the second equation, this R, notice it doesn't have a bar, like this one, is simply this R, the R bar, which I'll call it, divided by the molar mass okay, of the gas that you're studying. Okay, so if, the, if it was carbon dioxide that we're looking at, R would be 8.314 divided by 32 plus 12, which is the molar mass of carbon dioxide, and that would be R here. And it's very easy to derive to get these two. So we know that N equals M over double M, right? So let's put that into that equation. Okay. Now I'm going to take m out the front and divide here by. And you can see that if I just move this down one, one term, then it gives us. Oops, this is r bar. Then it gives us exactly what I just said. Okay. So it's very easy to show that those two are the same. Great. So, how do we use the ideal gas law? Well, the ideal gas equation is used to determine the molar volume of gases. So, you know when in the back of your periodic table where they say one mole of ideal gas at these conditions gives you this much volume. Okay? This is where it comes from, the ideal gas law. So as you can see here, if the pressure increases, the volume decreases, right? Because assuming the temperature is kept the same. So as P goes up, V has to go down if the temperature doesn't change. And of course, the number of moles doesn't change either. And obviously, the opposite happens. If V goes up, the pressure goes down. And that kind of makes sense. So you can see intuitively that kind of feels right. So how do we calculate the molar volume? Well, if the pressure temperature are known, and the number of moles is set to 1, then the volume can be easily calculated because it's just PV and RT. So if we know this one, that's good. We know this one. And we're saying this equals 1. And we also know this guy. So we know everything in this equation, so we can easily calculate V. Okay? Because we set N to be 1. Now, interestingly, it doesn't matter what the gas is, the volume will always be the same. So 
did you notice in that equation, I didn't specify what type of gas it was. I just had to state how many molecules or how many moles of that gas were present. It doesn't matter. And it would be the same for any gas, the molar volume. Okay. So the molar volume is the volume taken up by one mole of an ideal gas. So the molar volume is the space that a gas takes up if there's one mole of it. Now, that obviously can change based on the temperature and pressure. So you can see here our balloon takes up a certain volume. If the pressure and temperature is moderate, then it's this size. Now, if the temperature is very high and the pressure outside is very low, or the pressure inside it is very high, but we're talking about the pressure outside, then the balloon will get very big. But if the pressure on the outside is very high and the temperature is very low, the volume will shrink. So you can see that the molar volume changes based on the temperature and pressure. That's why whenever we have the back of the periodic table, it always specifies what the temperature and pressure are for that molar volume and what conditions that under, with, under what conditions that molar volume actually happens. Okay. So if you look on the back of your periodic table, you'll see things like at 100 kilopascals and 298 Kelvin, the molar volume is this. Alternatively, it could be this. At 101.3 kilopascals, which is what we call one atmosphere, which is the pressure that I experience when I'm standing underneath the Earth's atmosphere. And 298 Kelvin is 24.47. Now the difference, this very slight difference, is due to the different pressures. This is slightly lower pressure, so the, the volume is slightly bigger. This is slightly more pressure, so the volume is a little bit smaller. Okay? So that's that's what we're talking about. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on gas volumes and their relationship to the mole. We looked at the ideal gas law. Now you don't have to remember the ideal gas law, it's just here for your complete for, to complete your understanding. I think it's important to know, but it's not, su it's not incredibly necessary for your chemistry, your study of chemistry. But it does sort of nicely represent mathematically all of the things that we've talked about in terms of Avogadro's law and Guy Lussac's law as well. So you don't need to know it, but I would suggest that you very strongly uh, just remember it just so you can sort of mathematically toy around with what you've studied in chemistry. Okay, so we'll move on to the question segment now. So, using the ideal gas law, so remember that you won't actually have to do this in your exams, but I think it's good for you to understand this, just so you can see where all these numbers are coming from. Okay. So using the ideal gas law, prove that 101.3 kilopascals and 298 Kelvin, one mole of hydrogen gas occupies 24.47 liters. This is a proof question. So we start with our ideal gas law. PV equals N R bar T. And subbing in all the necessary data, and this is key. That's why I've highlighted it and made it blue. In SI units. Okay? We really need it to be in SI units or this won't work. Okay? So the SI unit for pressure is Pascal. So 101.3 kilopascals is 101.3 times a thousand kilopascals times the volume in meters cubed, which is the SI unit for volume, equals 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole times 298 Kelvin. So Kelvin is the SI unit for temperature. Okay, And then we just um, we basically rearrange. So V is the subject of the formula. And this is what we get. And finally, you get 0.02447 meters cubed. Okay. Now that doesn't look like that. Well, the numbers are sort of right, but the units are wrong. So how do we convert from meters cubed to liters? Well, we know that there are 1,000 liters in every meter cubed, so we will multiply that by 1,000, and lo and behold, you get the right answer. Okay. So it's just subbing it into a formula, basically. Okay. Explain why the volume of a gas is not affected by the molar mass of the gas. Well, the particle of a gas always takes up the largest volume at that set of conditions. So whatever the gas is, it will always try to take up the largest volume because that's what a gas does. That's how we define a gas. So this means that regardless of the type of gas, all gas molecules behave in a similar way. 
And this is reflected in the form of the ideal gas equation, since there's no dependence on the molar mass. And you might be saying, well, didn't you say R on mm is you know, some kind of dependence? Well, no, because it's just related to the moles. So the molar mass only appears in that equation because the number of moles is related to the molar mass. So indirectly, yes, it is related to the molar mass, but not, uh, it's not affected very much by it. Okay. Okay, so we're now going to take a step into my territory, which is you're a process engineer, and you've been tasked with finding a suitable container for a gas process. So we've got some kind of gas process happening. 60 kilograms of nitrogen gas will be in a 40 liter container at 500 degrees Kelvin. Calculate the minimum pressure rating of that container. So this is a really typical thing to do. We got some kind of, we need, we've got some kind of specification. We need to size our system based on this. So what do we do? Well, this is one application of the ideal gas law that you can use. Now this time we're going to use this one. And the reason why I'm going to use this one is because I've got a mass here. I don't have moles. I could just convert this to moles, but you know why waste the effort um, when I already have an equation that works? Okay, so remember that it's m r with no bar, but r with no bar is just r bar on molar mass. So p times forty over. So now we're just subbing in numbers, and remember s i units. Cannot stress this enough. S i units. So forty over one thousand to make it into meters cubed. So 40 liters divided by 1,000 is um, the number of meters cubed. 60,000 grams, um, this is the number, it, you can't change that number. 500 Kelvin is fine. And 28.02 is the molar mass of um, the molar mass of the nitrogen. Okay. Okay, so if we do the calculations, we get this. So 8901498.99 equals 0.04p. So we're looking for p. So we've got 22253747.2 pascals is the pressure in that system. Okay, we would, that's the pressure within that system. So if we divide by 1,000 to get kilopascals, 1, 2, 3, you'd have about 222,000 kilopascals. Then we divide by another thousand to get to megapascals. One, two, three. So we get 222.53 megapascals. Okay. That's a very huge number. It's a really, really big number. Um, we often don't get into megapascals. Um, well, many engineering processes don't get into the hundreds of megapascals. 10, 20 megapascals is doable, but this is really, really big. So I'd say maybe make the container a little bit bigger and you won't need as strong a container. Okay? So this is how we can use the ideal gas equation to actually do engineering type processes. Okay? So magnesium and hydrochloric acid are reacted together and a gas is given off in the process. If five grams of magnesium are used, then calculate the volume of gas released at 100 kilopascals and 298 Kelvin. So we start with the chemical equation. And there it is. It's just acid plus a metal gives you salt plus hydrogen gas. So NMG, so number of moles of magnesium, is just 5 over 24.31, which is 0 0.2057 moles. And from our equation, we know that the number of moles of hyd hydrogen is equal to the number of moles of magnesium, which is 0.2057. And so the volume is just 24.79 times the number of moles, which is 5.0987 liters. Okay? So that's that question. Okay, so question 15. 5 liters of oxygen is reacted with calcium at 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. If all the oxygen is consumed, calculate the mass of Ca that was required. Okay? Pretty simple question. Uh, it, all these questions are basically the same. I don't know if you've realized it or not yet, but in sort of the last five lessons or so, um, I've given you a lot of questions, and they're all basically the same setup. 
you calculate the number of moles of something. So you write the, the chemical equation. Then you calculate the number of moles of something that they give you in the question. Then using the chemical equation, you work out there's some relationship between the number of moles that you calculated and the number of moles of what you want to calculate. So let's say CA in this case. And then you can work it out just from that. So there's always that three-step process. And if you understand that now, your life will be so easy in HSE um, that I can't, that I, you know, it's going to be like, you're just going to realize that chemistry is actually this very easy science um, when it really is just an easy science. So a lot of people will struggle in chemistry, but if you realize this early on, it's going to be really, very easy for you. Okay, so we'll do this, that whole process again. So we start with chemical equation, and there it is, very simple chemical equation. Then we follow up with calculating the number of moles of one of the things in our, um, in our question. And in this case, we can calculate the number of moles of oxygen, because they give us all the data about oxygen. So it's just volume over the molar volume, which is 5 over 24.79, which is 0.2017 moles. Simple. Now from the equation, as I mentioned before, um, you just have to, the equation gives you, relates the number of moles of one thing to the number of moles of another. So the number of moles of calcium equals twice the number of moles of NO2. Oh, sorry, number of moles of oxygen, not NO2. Because um, so you can see here that for every one oxygen mole, two moles of calcium are required. So for every one, so calcium, the number of moles of calcium has to be twice as many as the oxygen. So it's 0 0.4034. Now knowing the number of moles of calcium, we can work out its mass from just rearranging n equals m over double m. So n equals calcium, uh, number of moles of calcium, and the molar mass of calcium, we can work out from our periodic table. And then we just do the arithmetic and we get 16.168 grams. So 16.168 grams reacts with five liters of oxygen to give you um, calcium oxide. Okay. So hopefully you've realized that this process is the same, and it's the same for everything. Um, pretty much any calculation you have in chemistry, with the exception of the heat of the enthalpy equations, um, will be the same. So if you understand this now, I guarantee you your chemistry life will be very, very cruisy. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on um, the ideal gas law and how gas volumes relate to moles. So I know that PV and RT is not taught in chemistry, but I teach it now just so that you can see it for yourself. And so to prove some of the other things that have been happening in chemistry that you have learned. So don't worry too much if you don't understand PV and RT or where it comes from, but just Knowing it is enough to prove a lot of the things that we've seen already. So um, I hope you've learned something, and I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.